beyond um, suffering. So from death to immortality. What we just chanted now, if you ask these three questions, what? What are we doing here? How? What's the method? Why? What's the benefit? What? How? Why? And the answers are from the unreal to the real. The method is knowledge, insight, what we're going to talk about today. And the benefit is transcendence of suffering and death. Alright. Advaita, Vedanta can be confusing. And the most confusing thing about Advaita Vedanta is there seems to be at the heart of Advaita teaching a paradox. What is the paradox? Some of you may have noted it, some have not. Let me put it before you. The paradox is this. You keep telling us, the non-dualist Advaita tells us that I'm not the body, not the mind, I'm the witness consciousness, not this, not this. One. And then you tell us that this consciousness is everything, body, mind, universe, everything is Brahman. Do you see the contradiction, the paradox? Tell me one or the other. Which is it? Either I am none of this, I am the un unaffected witness separate from everything in the universe. I can understand that. Or I am one with everything in the, in the universe. Which one is it? And Advaita Vedanta, when you listen to the teachings, it seems to say both things. And yet they seem to be absolutely opposite. Do you see the problem? If you don't see the problem, then the answer will not make any sense. <laughs> so the question must be there for the answer to make sense. So this is the question. And it's important to know the solution. I noticed it uh, in the last few years. People get confused. A lot of questions are about this. In some way or the other, they come back to this question. Because this core idea is not clear. It's a simple idea, but it has to become clear. This answer is this. The secret of Advaita Vedanta lies here. That Advaita has two steps. It's very simple. Once you when listen to it, you say, yeah, yeah, I knew that. But it had to be said. Advaita has two steps. The first step is to withdraw from body-mind in your understanding and to see what we are truly, to discover the self within, to discover the Atman within, Brahman within, I am Satchidananda, I am pure awareness of consciousness, not an ever-changing mind, not an ever-changing body, and certainly not a physical world, but I am this consciousness which we are talking about, that is step one. That's where all that, not this, not this, neti neti comes in. But having accomplished that step one, notice it's not non-dualism at all. It, it's literally dualism because now you have got pure consciousness and everything else. Mind and body and the world outside. <coughs> all of that is the objective world. That's still there. How is it non-dual? There are two and more than two. It's a very pluralistic world view. Earlier it was me here and everything else. Now I, what I've just done is, I am the witness consciousness and everything else. So it's not non-dualism yet. That's the step one. The step two is, when it becomes non-duality, everything that you have abandoned at till this point, all of that is reabsorbed, is understood to be nothing other than the consciousness you found yourself to be. I'll repeat, in step two, you take that consciousness you have found yourself to be and in relation to that when you question, interrogate the world outside, you find it is nothing other than appearances in that consciousness. So you discover there is no second reality apart from that consciousness. All the things which are experienced in consciousness are not apart, second, ontologically different to put it philosophically. They are not a second reality apart from you, the consciousness. Therefore, Advaita, not two. Then you have accomplished non-duality. Two steps. I'm not going to it anymore, but I hope I've conveyed what I wanted to say. Uh, if you want more details, I have a whole talk on this. This summer I gave this talk a couple of times at least. And one of them I saw just today. It's, it's online, available on YouTube. It's called, conveniently, 
Two steps to not do. If you Google it, it's from Santa Barbara. Yeah, so, two steps to not do. I deal with just this question. How the heart of Advaita is step one, stepping back into your reality, and step two, merging the external universe back into that reality. So there is non-humanity. Okay. That's how today's retreat has been organized. There are two sessions corresponding to these two steps. So the first session is discovering that we are pure consciousness. That's why I called it Awakening to Pure Awareness. Awakening to Pure Awareness. That means becoming aware. Not that the pure awareness has gone to sleep. It's always awake. But we must, we in the sense the mind must recognize its true nature as awareness. So that is step one. And the next step will be the second session, which is pure awareness is the ultimate reality. Reality of what? Of the entire universe. That is step two. So today's session is also divided into these two steps. First step is, who am I? The second step is, what is all this? So the first step, who am I? Do you notice that the famous hymn which many of us have heard, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham, Shankaracharya sings 1400 years ago, I am of the nature of pure bliss, I am Shiva, I am Shiva, I am consciousness bliss, I am Shiva. Um, there, do you notice that the first few lines are, how, how does he start? Mano I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the ego, I am not the memory, I am not the five senses, I am not the body made of the five elements. And then, I am awareness and bliss, I am Shiva, I am Shiva. So the first three lines of that verse, are neti neti, not this, not this, I am not this, I am not this, I am not this, then only you can discover yourself as the witness consciousness. So that's what we are going to do in the first session. I am using, I could use any text, all the texts of Advaita Vedanta, you are lucky, they all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. Is it too loud? No. So they all say the same thing. I am using this particular text, Aparoksha Lubhuti, I will not refer too much to it just once in a while, a little more in the second session. So the first session is to discover who am I. And our first response to this is, I know who I am. I love Mark Twain when he says, it's not what we do not know that gets us into trouble. It's what we know that it just ain't so. That's what gets us into trouble. <laughs> and I am witness consciousness, I am not the body and mind. Says, no, 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 that's not so. I know it's not so. So the first step, step is to realize who we are. Our first reaction is, I am this body. Who are you? Our first, my first answer will be here. I point to the body. Whatever we may say, whatever we may read or claim, we instinctively, instinctively identify ourselves with the body. This is who I am. So Vedanta begins there. It begins to help us to disidentify with the body. We identify with the mind. It will help us to disidentify with the mind. Don't worry, your body and mind will still be there. They won't disappear. They will still be there. In the second session, they will disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, you'll have had lunch by that time. <laughs> so, the second, I mean, the first session, we're just going to separate. Not physically, again, don't worry, you're not going to pop out of your body suddenly like that. That you are not the body. It's like you're sitting and driving the car and if you had the delusion that you are the car, and somebody pointed out to you, you are not the car, though you are in the car and driving it, it's not a very good example, because those who are philosophically trained, you know, it's like the little homunculus, a little man, in the, somebody inside there trying to control the body-mind. We are not talking about that. So, it will be a process of insight, showing us how I am not the body, I cannot be the body right now. Not after a long process of spiritual practice. Slowly and less and less the body, more and more spiritual. Not like that. Right now. Even a person who does not come to one Vedanta session of also is also equally not the body at all. 
just that the person doesn't know it. And I'm not even the mind. So the person we are identified with, this person, I'm not even that. That's also a covering. It's also an object. And something beyond that. That will be shown to us. Session one. How is it done? How will they show us? Remember, this is the path of insight. So we'll be given insight. We'll be given what are called pointers. They're called pointers in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. <coughs> but I like the term. When you first hear them, they will sound like arguments, intellectual arguments, and they are designed to show us that I am not, I cannot be the body. But how will you handle them? The process is, as I mentioned yesterday, hearing, reflecting, meditating. Hearing, first the teaching itself. Ask yourself, what did he say? To check whether the first stage is complete. What did he say? If you can say it back to yourself. Not maybe the literal words are used, but the sum and substance of what, what that pointed what was, what that argument was. This is the argument. If you can say it back to yourself, stage one is complete. What is the method of, do, of in stage one? Attentive, careful listening. Attentive, careful listening. What is he saying? And then repeating it back to yourself mentally. So this is what he said. Then the stage one is done. Stage two is assimilating it, understanding it, comprehending it. So stage two is called reflection. You should ask yourself in stage two. Stage one, what do you ask yourself? What did, what did he say? Stage two, ask yourself, do I get it? Did I get it? Is it clear to me? Or is it, I still have doubts, it's not clear, or I, I don't understand it at all? That's the point where you ask questions to yourself. What is it about it that I don't understand? What is my counter-argument? What is my objection to this? Ask yourself, ask me. That is stage two. Stage three is, stage two is, when do you know stage two is complete? What is the method of stage two? The method of stage two is doubting, questioning. How do you know stage two is complete? You say to yourself, I got it. It's clear. I know what he said, and now I understand it also. It's clear. And this stage two can happen immediately also. These pointers are actually pretty simple. Stage three is, I heard what you said, I get what you say, but is it a living truth to me? Right now that you are sitting in this chair there, it's not an argument, it's not a theory, it's not speculation, it's a fact. Exactly like that, what I said, this, these pointers, is it a fact? Can I honestly say it's a fact? For that, the method is, the clarity which you have got in stage two, you have to stay with that clarity. Stay with it, think about it, ponder upon it, keep it close to your mind till it becomes a living truth. It may become a living truth for you immediately or it may take some time. So these are the three stages. Listening, reflecting, meditating. Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Still haven't started. <coughs> this is all preparation. Alright, now the groundwork is done. Here are the pointers. Pointers for what? To extricate ourselves from this identification with the body. We are identified with the physical body in Sanskrit, sthula sharira, gross body, a physical body. We are closely identified, mixed up with, entangled with the subtle body, mind, sukshma sharira. And Vedanta says you are neither of them. You must disentangle yourself from that, at least in your understanding. And then you will be able to easily, directly see yourself as that awareness, which you are right now, but entangled. All right. Stage one, the body, the physical body. Physical body is what we are aware of, what is publicly seen, this person sitting on the chair or standing here. Now this book, Aparokshanabhuti, written by Shankaracharya, you get copies outside if you are interested. And I've taught the book verse by verse. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to quote from the verses so much today. Um, it's what is called a Prakarana Grantha, introductory text. And verses 17 to 33, yes, are about this one. 
disentangling yourself from the physical body. 17 to 33. I just summarize it right now. I'll give you, there are many pointers here, but let me give you just five of them. Five pointers. <coughs> the first pointer is in Sanskrit, it is called Nirvikara Savikara. Unchanging and subject to change. The physical body, the first thing that is put forward for our consideration is the physical body is subject to change. Is it not so? From babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age, the body is continuously changing. How different it is, what it is now, what it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it has changed so much. Yes? So it has changed so much. Do sit down. Okay. Oh. Okay. She's our photographer. Uh, yeah. you, you go ahead. You do, do what you have to do. Sorry. No, that's not right. It's subject to change. Note that it is subject to change. What I looked like when I was twenty year, when I was five years old. What I looked like when I was a six-month-old baby, maybe today even my mother won't be able to see, the, you know, to recognize the differences in the uh, pictures. So tremendous change. Um, a doctor said every cell in the body is, except for a few nerve cells maybe, they're all changed over a period of seven years. Over seven years, not suddenly after seven years. <laughs> we don't shed skin like a snake or something. But it is all changed. But the physical substance in your body is not what it was yesterday. In fact, I read somewhere, we are continuously, it may sound gross, but we are continuously shedding uh, material from the body. Particles, <coughs> cells, debris from the body. That's how uh, criminal detectives, you know, they find out criminals because most people do not realize how much evidence they leave behind whenever they visit any place at all. So we continuously, this body is disintegrating and being built up again by uh, eating and drinking and assimilating food. It is a process of continuous change. In classical Sanskrit literature, Yaska, the lexicographer, he mentions sixfold changes. Shadveda Vikara, Vikara means change. Sixfold changes of the physical body. Jayate being born. Second, asti, coming into existence. You might think that's a very strange change. But it's logical. It was not there as a physical body. Now it's there. So after being born, coming into existence. As jayate, asti, that is coming into existence. Vardhate. Vardhate, it grows, develops from babyhood to childhood to teenage continuous process of maturation. Tremendous changes. Viparinamati, it reaches maturity in the twenties and thirties. A doctor said, Swami, we don't tell you these things, but um, the truth is, after forty, it's all the way down. <laughs> you can manage it, the downward decline. You can manage it. You can do yoga and gluten-free and things like that. And it's all, all that is good. It's a wise way of living. But it's managing an inevitable decline. It's managing a decline. We all know that. What was natural when you were, what happened without any care at all when you were 19, 20, 21 years old. Now it requires a lot of maintenance when you are 45, 50, 60 years old. A lot of maintenance. So if you maintain it well, good. I remember I was in this um, synagogue two weeks ago on Saturday after Shabbat and wanted to attend their um, services. And sitting next to me was this gentleman who said, it's my 98th birthday today. And he looked quite fit. 98th birthday. And somebody told me that uh, it, it was just the day before the famous New York Marathon. So he said that he's, he holds the record 
for the oldest man to run the marathon. He ran the marathon when he was 96. So now he's 98. So of course somebody whispered to me, he didn't run, he walked. <laughs> I said, that's good enough. I don't know that I'll be able to walk. But all five boroughs, in, uh, it's not so easy at all. So you can manage. It's, the decline can be managed. But still it's decline. It is called apakshiyati, the fifth stage. And the sixth stage we all know, nashyati, destru destruction, death. So six stages, the body goes through these six evolutions, transformations. And I know intuitively, I am the same person who was in the child's body, in the teenager's body, in the middle-aged person's body, and I am the same person in the old person's body. And when the dead body goes, I am still there, hopefully, <laughs> if all this is right. So the changes of the body are not my changes. I have, a, I have an intuitive feeling. All of us have. Look back. Try to experience the fact that I was in that very different teenager's body. I was in that very different child's body. I was in that very different baby's body. It's not that the baby was somebody else and this person somebody else. No. Then the changing and the unchanging cannot be the same thing. The argument is this. Changing and unchanging cannot be the same thing. I, the intuitively unchanging person, whatever I am, and the clearly changing body, the two cannot be the same thing. Savikara nirvikara. Because of that, I am not the body. First pointer. Apply those three things. What did he say? Tell yourself. Do I get the argument? Intellectually. And can I see that it's a fact? Is it just speculation? No, it's a fact. Very simple fact. And therefore the implication is very interesting. I cannot literally be the body. I'm embodied. I'm here. But literally this thing, I cannot be it. That takes us to the second point. The second point. I remember I was discussing this in a particular session. And there was a Tibetan Buddhist nun in the audience. She wanted to listen to some Advaita Vedanta teachings. And afterwards she came and said, Swami, you know these pointers that you gave? In our tradition, do you know how much we have to go through before even we are allowed to listen to these things and you casually get them out like that? <laughs> yes. And there is a value to that. If you surround it with the ritual and secrecy and after six months or one year of practice and then you hand it over ceremoniously to the student. The student takes it seriously. Otherwise, you know, something he said in a retreat. But the food was good. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a superficial approach. These are very valuable things that we are, we are being uh, given. So, the first pointer was changing and unchanging. I, the intuitively unchanging person, cannot be the clearly changing body. One second. This is called drashta and drishya. That which is the object of experience cannot be the subject. That which is the seen, S-E-E-N, cannot be the seer, S-E-E-R, seer. Very clear. I am reading the book. So the eyes are seen in a very naive way and the book is something that is seen. Clearly the two are different, physically different. In fact, the only thing that the eyes themselves cannot see are eyes. the eyes themselves. The limits of our vision, the limits of our vision are not out there. Even the furthest thing can be revealed to you by modern telescopes. The limits of our vision are not tiny things. Even the tiniest of things can be revealed to you by electronic, uh, 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 this, uh, what do you call them? Um, electron microscopes. That's not the limit of your vision. The limit of your vision is here. The eyes cannot objectify something which are not separate from. They can only objectify something which is separate from the eyes. So what the eyes are seeing are different from them. Extend that further. You, the conscious experiencer, must be different from what you are experiencing. The subject and the object must be 
two different entities, again, ontologically different. Now apply it to the body. Is the body drishya an object? Yes, you can see it. See it, huh? You can see it. It's an object. Every part of your body is an object. You can see it, you can touch it, you can taste it, smell it, hear it. You know, in tummy, tummy rumbles, you can hear it. So the body is an object to all five of your senses. You can consciously experience the body. You are the drashta, the body is drishya. And drashta and drishya must be two different things. So the second pointer is this. I cannot be the body because the body is an object of my senses. It's an object and I am the one who is the subject. I am the seer and the body is the seen. Drashta and drishya, they cannot be the same thing. Therefore, I, whatever I am, I cannot be the body. I, the conscious experiencer, cannot be the body because it is experienced. Again, apply those three steps. What did he say? Do I get it? Is it a fact? Second pointer. The Tibetan Buddhists call these pointers Vajra Jhenka. Diamond slivers. That means they cut through the, the darkness of our bondage. Thunderbolt. Vajra Thunderbolt. Third, third pointer. It's a subtle one, but a very powerful one. What it says is this. The body is insentient, and I am sentient. Chit jara, consciousness and uh, insentient. Sentience and insentience. I am aware, the body is something I'm aware of. It's not aware. Body is not aware of me, I am aware of the body. The earlier one was subject and object, seer and seen. Now the argument is, the pointer is conscious and not conscious. Though they are very closely linked. Chit jara. You are sentient. You are aware of the body. The body is not aware of you. What does that mean? Try it now. Look at your hand. This is something that is a psychologist in New York, Greg Good, he is um, he incorporates a lot of Vedanta into his counseling sessions. So he developed this procedure. He said, "Just look at your hand. Try, try it now. Stare at your hand. Your right hand. Stare at it. Now notice the texture of this experience of staring at your hand. Don't you feel that you are staring at the hand? Do you feel that the hand is staring back at you?" The hand, is the hand aware of you or are you aware of the hand? You are aware. Don't be shy. Yes, you are aware of the hand. It's a fact. You are aware of the hand. You would say so. It's pretty simple. You are aware of the hand. And the other hand? You are aware of that too. In fact, every part of the body is just like these hands. You are aware of them. And the body is a collection of these parts. So you are something aware of the body. Just as this hand is not aware of you, similarly the entire body is not aware of you. You are aware of the body. Awareness is on your side, not the body's side. Does it make sense what I am saying? Because you are conscious and the body is not conscious, the conscious and the not conscious cannot be the same thing. How can you be conscious and unconscious at the same time? It's, uh, it is jara. In Sanskrit it's a nice word. Jara means inert or insentient. And chit, you are conscious. Because of that third pointer, you are not the body. Fourth pointer. This is a simple one, but effective, elegant. This one is in Sanskrit pratyak parak. Pratyak means inner, parak means outer. Notice your experience of the body. If I ask you, you feel embodied in this body, in your body. But where do you feel yourself to be? Inside the body or outside? A pretty tentative crowd. 
You're like that person, you know, the professor asked, so what's the answer to the question? And the student said, what do you want it to be? <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel right now? How do you feel? I'm in the body. I am experiencing the body from somewhere in there. I don't feel I'm experiencing the body from there, out of body experience, so that might be possible. But normally we feel I'm somewhere in the body, and the body is somewhere outside me. It encloses me. So it is somehow outer to me, I am somehow inner to the body. The outer and the inner cannot be the same thing. It must be in some sense separate from you. Pratyapara, when you're sitting in the car, Literally, you feel I'm in the car and the car is around me. You don't feel that the car is out there and I'm, up, I'm sitting out here. It's around me. In some similar sense, you feel I am in the body somehow. So you are inert to the body and the body is external to you. In your psychological lived experience, when I say inner, we keep saying the inner self, inner self. By inner self, I don't mean physically inner to the body, because if you investigate physically inner to the body, you find more body. You find flesh and blood and bones and all sorts of messy and gooey stuff. That's still the body. But what I mean by inner is in a subtle sense, as you experience it. Uh, inner means closer and closer to your inner psychological being. That's what I mean by inner. So you are inner to the body and the body is relatively speaking, psychologically speaking, outer to you. Pratyak and para outer, inner, they cannot be the same thing. If I am wearing a shirt, I cannot be a shirt. So, Pratyat Parat, it's a very simple, it sounds like a simple-minded argument, but it's very elegant. It cannot be the same thing. Second, I guess it's the fourth one. There are many, many choices. Um, fifth, let me end with the fifth uh, pointer. Fifth pointer is um, Saguna Nirguna. Anything that you may say, the body has many attributes. It's tall or short or dark or fair or stout or skinny, healthy or unhealthy, overweight or uh, underweight, whatever it is. The body has many attributes. You can describe the body, you can, take, you can take, write pages about what a particular body looks like. A doctor can give a lot of description about the body. They are attributes of the body. But you, the conscious experience of the body, inside, you have no attributes at all. Whatever attributes you can attribute to yourself, you will notice they are attributes of the body or the mind. True or not? Yes. The attributes, those attributes are objects. Say, I am a tall person, body. I am a hungry person. They'll say prana, it's a physiological function. I am a, I am a good natured person, mind. It's a personality trait. It's not literally you. You say, how? When you are in deep sleep, are you a good natured person? Was Hitler an evil person when he was in deep sleep? Those traits, the evil that Adolf Hitler was, was a trait of the personality, of the mind. That you are a good person is a trait of the mind. So objects, the qualities, the attributes, body has many attributes and you have none. The awareness itself has no attributes. You see, at least I am aware, not I am aware, you are awareness. That's what we are trying to say. So, you the you you are you are attribute less nirguna, and the body of course has many attributes saguna. Fifth and final pointer. There are at least seven or eight pointers given in this book. I'm just giving you a few, and I left out some. Just for the sake of completion, let me read one or two verses. You'll get the flavor of the original. I just summarized it. So what does Shankaracharya in his own words, what does he say? Um, in the text, for example, I can take anything. Oh, here's a nice one which I left out. 
verse number 17. In fact, the first argument, the first pointer which Shankaracharya gives is this. Part, part less and many parts. You have no parts. <coughs> you are unanalyzable into parts. The body has parts. Obviously, body has parts. So many organ systems, so many cells and tissues, uh, so many subcellular parts, millions and billions of parts, and you are partless. You, the consciousness, you don't have a part. Part means analyzable into smaller parts, no? So the partless and the one with many parts, how can they be the same thing? So Shankaracharya says, 17th verse. Atma Vinesh Kalo Yeko Deho Bahu Bira Britaha Tayo Raikyam Prapashanti Kimagyanam Matapadam. He says, Atma, you Vinesh Kalo, you have no parts and you are one. Notice this, the two arguments here actually. One is you don't have parts, you can't be divided into parts. The body can be divided into parts. That's what surgery is all about. And you are also one. You will say, so what? What's the point here? Point is, do you, we always consider ourselves to be one person. We don't consider ourselves to be a committee. Are you a committee in your head? <laughs> even somebody with multiple personality disorder, even they are one person at a time. <laughs> Yes, they identify with one personality. You are one. And the body is a collection of many things. So this is the argument. You are one and partless. The body is a collection of many things put together. The one and the collection. You identify them together. We all do that all the time. I say, I am this body. I, the partless and the many-parted body. What greater ignorance could there be? This is one verse. I have not given this argument. This is another pointer. You can add to the sixth pointer. The next verse, for example. Atma niyama kashchantar deho bahyo niyamyakaha tayo raikyam prapashyanti kimagyanam in fact, there are two arguments here. One is the well-known, the, the one which I have already told you, that you are inner and the body is outer. So he says, antar, atma is in inner. Always felt as inner to the body and the body is outer. The inner and outer are taken to be one thing. What, what ignorance? How can there be greater ignorance than this? This is one pointer. And a new pointer he gives here, which I have not told you. You always feel yourself as the controller of the body, and the body feels as something that is controlled. Niyamyata and Niyamya. That which is the guider, controller, um, the one in charge. And the body is something that is like a vehicle for you. So it's a psychological argument. This is another pointer. How can they be the same thing? How can the driver and the car be the same thing? Unless it's the boomy driverless car. <laughs> and the driver and the car are the same thing. <laughs> So like this it goes on. This is about the physical body. In Sanskrit, sthula sharira. Exactly the same thing you can do with the mind. The subtle body. I know it's a no-brainer, it should be obvious, but often it's good to make obvious things obvious. There is such a thing as a subtle body. When I use a word like subtle body, oh, it's some weird uh, philosophical thing. No, no, no. Right now you are, you've got it. It's something that is... The division between physical body and subtle body, or in, in Sanskrit, sthula sharira, sukshma sharira. The way it's translated is gross body and subtle body. But gross has another meaning in America, <laughs> which means smelly or um, messy or something like that, gross. And the physical body can be gross. So, <laughs> so gross body is a good name for it. Gross body is something that is public. That is what the doctor examines. That is what everybody can see. This is the one sitting there in the chair. That is the one which is there. Everybody can see it and interact with it. That's the physical body. Here. Which you can see, touch, smell, taste. Which you can weigh. Which you can treat in a hospital. That's the physical body. 
But there is also a subtle body, undeniable. Your thoughts, emotions, memories, desires. So that, but that's also the physical body. That's what the doctors will tell you. Don't believe that. <laughs> there is no proof for that. How is uh, 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 how are your thoughts, feelings, emotions, your first person experiences generated by the brain and nervous system? No doctor, no scientist knows. Not only they do not know, they have no clue how to begin, where to begin. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. I mentioned it yesterday. Vedanta says, look at your own experience. You experience your body in two ways. One is the physical body, which everybody else can see, and one is your internal experience, which only you have access to. First person experience. That which you have internal access to, only you. Your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your memories, only you can access directly. That internal experience which is continuously going on inside you, which you call I the person, that's the subtle body, Sukshma Shari. Even that is not consciousness. So subtle body. Now am I the subtle body? Am I the person in the physical body? Most sensitive, educated adults would say, yeah, I'm not exactly this mass of flesh and blood, but I am the person in this body. That's what we would say. And Vedanta says, no, you're not. You're not even the person in this body. Why? Use those same arguments. All right. Work with me here. What are the five pointers? First pointer? Changing, and changing. changing unchanging. Savikar and Nirvikar. Subject to change and not change. Is the subtle body, is your mind subject to change? Yes. Yes. Uh, so of course. <laughs> oh boy, does it change? From the morning till now, how many times, you know, sleepy and then alert and curious and bored and excited and, uh, and happy and irritated. From the morning till now, in one day, in less than one day, half a day, how many times the mind has changed? And imagine how the mind has changed over years and decades of your life. So the mind is subject to tremendous change. And you, aren't you the same person who was sleepy and who is now alert, hopefully? Yes. Aren't you the same person who was curious, who was bored, who was excited? Same person. Mind is changing, curious, bored, excited. You are the same person. I felt curious, I felt bored, I felt excited. That I is constant. You don't say that that guy was bored, but I am curious. No. So the mind is subject to change and you are not. Therefore, you cannot be the mind. Changing and changing cannot be the same thing. It's more difficult to apply these pointers to the mind. It's subtle, but exciting also to apply it and see that a space develops between you and your mind. The mind is a thing. It's a subtle machine. It's a powerful, if you will, a powerful app. It's an app or a collection of apps. Memory is an app. Uh, intellect is an app. Creativity is an app. Desires, and uh, they are all apps. But they're not you. Second point is? Seer and seen. Can you see the mind? Yes, you can. It's called introspection. When you look inside, yes, I can see. It's a happy thought. It's a sad thought. It's a feeling. Whole of this mindfulness meditation is based on that. Be the observer. You can make the mind an object of experience. Looking inside your mind, introspectively reporting inner states, seer and see. If you are the seer and the mind is the seeing, then you cannot be the mind. You are the awareness of in which thoughts arise and shine and disappear. Like motes of dust in a beam of sunlight. Have you seen that? Motes of dust. Similarly, you are like a beam of sunlight in which the thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories are like those motes of dust dancing around. You are not that. Third pointer. Sentient, insentient, conscious, not conscious, chit jara in Sanskrit. 
This is really amazing. You put your mind to it. If you think about it, the one thing that people think is conscious is the mind. After all, what is con not conscious is not the mind. And Vedanta says even the mind is not conscious. The mind shines with a borrowed light. It's like the moon shining with sunlight. We talk about moonlight, but really, there is no such thing as moonlight. Even when the moon is shining gloriously in the night sky and illumining the dark earth, you can confidently say there is no such thing as moonlight. Are you mad? No. If the light of the sun being reflected from the moon, in the same way, it's consciousness shining in the mind, making the mind seem lit up by consciousness. Thoughts seem to shine in awareness, but the awareness does not belong to the thoughts. So, the mind is not conscious. I, I can prove it to you right now, that the mind is not conscious. Mind is, what is the mind? Thoughts? Alright, try this. Take up a thought. Nothing comes. You see, that's the mind. When you try to meditate and be quiet, it will be crowded with thoughts. Now the Swami is telling you to think a thought, no thought comes. It's blank. Alright, I have a thought. 2 plus 2 is 4. A thought. Think it. 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay? Hold that thought. Now let me ask you a question. Are you aware of 2 plus 2 4 or is 2 plus 2 4 aware of you? That thought. Is it aware of you or are you aware of the thought? You are aware of it. Obviously, it's such a simple experiment. 2 plus 2 4 is a thought which you are thinking. It's if there in your awareness. It has no awareness of its own. It is not aware of you. 2 plus 2, 4 doesn't say, hey, there you are again. No. You are aware of it. You can see it directly. You are conscious of the thought. Thoughts are not conscious. Chit jar. The conscious and the not conscious cannot be the same thing. You cannot be the mind. Fourth pointer. Inner outer. Inner, Inner and outer. Pratyat para. If you apply it, you will see the mind. Where are you experiencing the mind? Are you experiencing the mind from, you know, like, here, I am here and the book is there. It is outer to me. Similarly, thoughts are also, in that sense, outer to me. I am experiencing the thoughts from within somewhere. Does it make sense? You are not experiencing the thoughts like a scientist watching in a scan. Rather, you are experiencing it consciously from inside, some inside within codes. So, even thoughts are outer to you. You are inner to the thoughts. Pratyat para. You cannot, inner and outer cannot be the same thing. Pratyat para cannot be the same thing. Last one? Yes. Our subtle body has characteristics. Just like the physical body is tall or short, dark or fair, male or female, the mind also has characteristics. Good natured, irritable, Curious, intelligent, dull, whatever you call it. And the same mind can have different characteristics at different times of the day, different phases of life. So the mind also has characteristics. Saguna and you, the consciousness, are attributeless, nirguna. You are pure light, pure radiance shining upon the mind. The two cannot be the same. Oh, he is a bitter person. No, now after Vedanta you must say, he is the same pure consciousness shining on a bitter mind. Illumining a bitter mind. Adolf Hitler was a horrible, evil person. No, he is the same untainted pure consciousness shining on a perverted, evil mind. Five pointers. Changing and unchanging, you cannot, you the unchanging awareness cannot be the changing mind. Seer and seen, you the consciousness and the mind which is seen, experienced, cannot be the, you cannot be the mind. Conscious and not conscious, amazing, even the mind is not conscious. In modern consciousness studies, this is the source of great confusion. Sometimes they are talking about consciousness, sometimes they are talking about mind and they don't make a distinction. That's why they end up in a lot of philosophical confusion. So, um, changing a, a conscious and non-conscious. You are consciousness. Mind is not conscious. Fourth? Inner and outer. Yes, the mind is even outer to you. 
Mind is inner to the body. Mind is inner to the body, which is felt as being outer to you. Last one? Yes. Mind is full of attributes and disturbed mind, calm mind. Oh, that reminds me very funny. I, um, where was this? Oh, in Denver, I met these, uh, in my host's house, there were two guests, two teenage uh, girls who were singing a song. Happy Lama, Sad Lama. I don't know, it's not of our generation, it's for <laughs> teenagers now. So I was curious, what is this song? Lama? Which Lama? I thought, is it like a Tibetan Lama or is it like the Lama, the, the South American, like a small camel? Yeah. So it turned out it's like a small camel, it's, it's about a small camel and it's a song. And the interesting thing is, the song is like this Happy Lama, Sand Lama, Mentally Disturbed Lama. <laughs> So even lamas can be mentally disturbed. They can be happy and sad and mentally disturbed. They are all attributes of the mind. Oh, I, I, when I told this joke in another place, it was in Cleveland. A gentleman said, I must share this with you. Not relevant at all to Vedanta, but he said, when we were kids, we were memorizing words. So little poems were made. So, about Lama, you know the single led Lama, double led Lama, the, the animal has L-L-A-M-A. He said we were made to memorize this. The single led Lama, he is a priest. The double led Lama, he is a beast. <laughs> and, and you can bet your silk pajama there is no triple led Lama. <laughs> You are not the subtle body, the mind also. Mind, intellect, memory, ego, none of them. You are not even the sense of I, ego. You are not even that. These distinctions are not made by even by modern uh, consciousness studies experts. That's why they keep getting confused. I know one top leading expert. She is arguing that, no, no, consciousness is not constant. Sometimes there is no consciousness. For example, when you are in deep concentration, a surgeon is doing an operation, a, a, a tennis player is absorbed in the game, so there is no consciousness, you just lose sense of yourself. You can see the problem, what she, the error she is making. She is talking about self-consciousness, the ego sense. I am playing the game, I am doing the operation. That feeling disappears if you are very intensely concentrated. That's the ego, ahankara. That's also a function of the mind. If you are an intensely concentrated mind, those functions will stop. But does that mean that you are unconscious? God forbid, is the surgeon becoming unconscious during the, concentra during the operation? No, 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 no. They are fully aware. It's the mind which has stopped putting up the ego sense there because the mind is fully concentrated. There is a psychology to that also. So anyway, Vedanta helps us to under clearly understand this. So with these five pointers, you are not the physical body, you are not the subtle body, you are the unchanging consciousness, seer, experiencer. But to be an experiencer, you have to experience with the body mind. The inner attributeless awareness. This is called Atman in Sanskrit. It is called Sakshi, the witness consciousness in, in uh, Vedanta. This is who I am. Are you with me till now? Yes. I'm sorry, but I played a bad, a nasty trick on you. All of this is rejected now. Whatever we did now, it's no good. Now, Shankaracharya having detailed explanations of all of this, in the 40th verse, 41st verse, he says, what good is this? It's no good at all. This is stage one. You know what verse is? It's a shocker. After all this, so you've been uh, tricking us? Actually, yes. Let's see now. After doing it, the entire thing is completed. Then Shankaracharya says, Ityatmadeha bhagena prapanchasyeva satyata yathokta takka shastrena taka kim purushathata Having done all this, all that you have done is, earlier you were saying, I am the body and there is the world. Now you are saying, I am the consciousness and there is the world. What have we achieved? It's still the same thing. 
It's not non-duality, it's not Advaita, as I said, first step. The world is still as it is, the body is still as it is, the mind is still as it is, life goes on as it is, and you are some kind of witness consciousness. So, non-duality is not established. He says, as Dr. Shastra and as the dualists, Nyaya philosophers, Samkhya philosophers. Actually, this, this thing is also a tremendous accomplishment, there's no doubt about it. But what Shankaracharya is aiming for is much higher than this. Absolute non-duality. Everything is consciousness. So he says, now we must take the second step. This is not enough. Then why did you say this? It's not even true. You know, I am other than the body, mind and world. No, 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 you are actually one with everything. That's the truth Advaita Vedanta wants to say, wants to put forward. But now you separated. You, you have shown us as if I am separate from everything. And Shankaracharya says, actually it's not true. But we did till now. <laughs> then why did you do it? He says in the next verse, forty second. Ityatma deha bhedena dehatmatvam nivaritam idanim deha bhedasya yasatvam sputam uchyate Having done this process, what we have done is we have removed your identification with the body. Till now we thought, I am the body, I am this one. Now we clearly know that I am the witness of this one. I am awareness, I am consciousness, and the, I am not the body mind. Though the body and mind is there, but I am something apart from it, in it, experiencing it, using it. But I am not limited by this. The birth of the body is not my birth. The disease of the body is not my disease. Not that I am saying the body is not born or the body is not diseased. Of course the body is born. Of course the body ages. Of course the body gets disease and pain. And the death of the body is also not my death. Similarly for the mind. The desire there, the frustration there, the anger there, the unhappiness there. The happiness there. All of that. They are in the mind. And I am aware of them. Now, this is true as far as it goes. So the point was to dissociate yourself, to clearly see you are not body mind. Now next he will say, now we can see that we are one with everything, including body mind. That will come next. How will that be accomplished? Deva Bhedasya Yasattva Muskuta Uchyate. Starting with the mind, body and external universe, this entire category of objects, they are not a real separate thing. They are appearances in you, the consciousness. Now you have got a clarity about yourself as consciousness. In that consciousness, mind appears, body appears, and external universe appears. They are appearances. They are not a separate reality. Right now we have been talking about separating two things. But if you separate two things, both are real. Both are there. Now having done this, we will see what is this separate thing called the universe. It is nothing other than something appearing in me, the consciousness. Not apart from consciousness. If it is not apart from consciousness, it is not a second thing. Dvaita, it's not that. Consciousness is the only thing. In your dreams, for example, when you see many people, go to many places, is there duality or non-duality? What does, it, what does it feel like? It feels like duality. I am seeing people, things are happening, there are people, places, events in my dreams. But when you wake up, you, it's gone, no doubt. But you also realize all of it was nothing other than me, the, mind, the dreaming mind. You realize that? Are you with me? Yes. Therefore, even when you were seeing it, it was not a second reality apart from the dreamer. In the dream world, there is advaita, non-duality. Non-duality of what? The dreamer's mind with respect to dream objects. Similarly, the argument will be, in this world of experience also, there is non-duality. With respect to what? Not the mind. With respect to consciousness. So that's what he's going to show. That the entire world of objects, asattvam, mithyatvam, the appearance nature, they are all appearances in one reality, which is you, the consciousness. That is going to be the second stage. 
What did it have we accomplished? Awakening to pure awareness. Swami, awakening to pure awareness, I can hardly stay awake. What is <laughs> Yes, Advaita sometimes has that effect. <laughs> Vedanta has a soporific effect. But here is what I have handed over to you. I set up, let's say, five pointers to dissociate yourself, to see that anything that is an object cannot be you. And that means what you thought was you, body, mind, your entire life. It is not denied, but it's not you. It does not limit you. You are something much greater than that. It's a great sense of freedom you should have. Oh, it's a thing. It's not me. The aging of the body is not my aging. The disease of the body is not my disease. The unsettlement, frustration in the mind, it's there. I can feel it. But because you can feel it, it's not you. Questions? At this stage? Yes. So, the mind for me, my name is or it come here. Would they recording it? So uh, my name is Abhay Good morning. Uh, on, in verse 17, you mentioned uh, the body can be divided into parts. Hmm. Can you elaborate uh, the same way how you can uh, give an example on on the mind or compartmentalize? Yes. Into yes, very easily. Um, if you see the Vedantic definition of the mind, antakarana, inner instrument, it has multiple parts. Ego is a part, ahankara. Uh, memory is a part, chitta. Uh, the mind itself, they have a special term for that, manas, that's a part. The intellect is a part. Uh, each of them has separate functions. They are parts of the same thing, the subtle body, but they have different functions. Uh, the ego has the function of um, of what is called Abhimanatmika. It uh, unifies everything that I am thinking, smelling, walking, talking. Uh, all these activities, these disparate activities are integrated by one function of the mind called the ego, which owns all of them, appropriates all of them. Memory, storage and recollection, that's one part of the mind. Um, intellect, which we are using now, trying to understand, questioning, thinking, that's another part of the mind. In fact, if you want to go deeper into it, the subtle body, according to Vedanta, has 19 parts. 19 parts. What are the 19 parts of the subtle body? Five sense organs. Not the physical organs, the, the powers of those physical organs. The conscious experience of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Five. Five motor organs. And then there's something called pancha prana. Those who do puja and all you know, prana, bhana, vyana, dana, samana which are physiological activities, digesting food, breathing, gut circulation, all of those things are done by some subtle forces in the body. They are called the pancha prana. So that's how many? Five, 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 fifteen. Now that four more. Mana, buddhi, jitta, ankara. Mind, uh, intellect, memory and ego. These are the parts of the mind, of the subtle body. Yes. If you want to look at it in modern psychological sense, you have the many are similar intellect, creativity, memory. Uh, you can talk about the subconscious, so called subconscious, all of those are there. Yes. Um, now, now that I'm not the body, how important it is to keep the body clean that it reflects um, very bright. Yes, absolutely. It's important. As important as it is to maintain the car in working order as important as it is to maintain the temple nicely because the deity is put there. Because you, the deity, according to Vedanta, you are none other than God. You are the deity, the, the murti in the temple. You are the consciousness in that body. Because you are there, the body must be maintained properly. And more on a more practical note, I think it was Swami Pavitra who said, uh, one of our early Swamis, he said, don't abuse the horse you cannot dismount from. <laughs> right now, you, the body is your companion. Until it dies, it's there. It's much wiser to take care of it. It's always been told that um, 
body, the health of the body is the first um, foundation of dharma. Sharira, adya sal dharma sadhana. Body is the first instrument for accomplishing dharma. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Please come to the microphone. Uh, Anand, uh, you mentioned that the four attributes are mana, buddhi, chitta, chitta and yes. But then, if uh, that is in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, when they say uh, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha, that chitta is mana, buddhi, Yes. No. So that word, then, word chitta is used in different senses. So in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, the word chitta includes the entire mind. It is not just memory. So mana, buddhi, would be part of chitta. Ah, mana, would be part of chitta. So all the movements of manas, buddhi, ahankara and chitta and memory are included under chitta vritti Yes. Yes. Could you explain a little bit the difference between Atma and consciousness? Atma is conscious. There is no difference. According to Advaita Vedanta, Atma means, what is Atma? We often say, my Atma is fine but I have many problems. <laughs> you are the Atma. Atma is not like your kidney or your uh, liver. You are, literally you are the Atma. You think that you are the body, you think you are the mind, but what we saw now is you are not body and mind. The Atman is awareness, is consciousness. Pure consciousness. What do I mean by pure consciousness? Again, by pure consciousness I don't mean some, something very pure and holy and nice and clean. No, what it means is consciousness without any object, without mind, without body, consciousness in itself. You are that. Tattvamasi. Atman and consciousness are one and the same thing. You want to do next. Do it first, you can. Tell us your name and ask a question. Hello, Sarajan. My name is Nidika. And my question is while following Advaita Vedanta, what is the significance of Ishtadeva in our lives? And other related question is like uh, non dualists such as uh, Sri Ramakrishna. Shankaracharya and his guru's guru, Gaurava, they were the followers of universal mother, divine mother. Yes. So why they worshipped mother, yes. like uh, Lord Shiva or some other day? I understand. Yes. yes. So, you are asking basically what if, if what we are talking about seems to be a very austere, cold, intellectual path. And yes, you are right, it is. But in Sanatana Dharma, it has always been an integral approach. Did Shankaracharya have bhakti or not? Yes. Of course, some of the most extraordinary devotional hymns are written by Shankaracharya. Did Sri Ramakrishna have bhakti? This Swami, what are you saying? <laughs> he is regarded more as a bhakta than a jnani. Swami Vivekananda said about Sri Ramakrishna, yes. the old man was devotion outside, he was inside all jnana. He said nothing about himself, I am jnana outside, inside I am all devotion, <laughs> all bhakti inside. So, in integral approach, the way I am presenting it is because our retreat is on insight meditation, it is a path of jnana yoga, that's why I am presenting it this way. It's good to learn each one separately and then in your practice you must integrate. Just because you have attended in t uh, this uh, uh, insight meditation camp doesn't mean that you stop. Uh, shut down your, your, your temple and don't listen to bhajans anymore, don't uh, practice bhakti or japa, disaster. That will lead to disaster. All practices which you are doing should continue. This will only give you, make it more real, more powerful, more effective. So Shankaracharya had a full range of bhakti. Why especially Divine Mother? Because there is, it's one approach to it. Even Advaitins use it. But, um, after all this, there will be a question in your mind. If it was so easy, then we mostly be enlightened all of us. Can't be so easy. There must be a catch, some fine print that you are not telling us. And there is. It, it's not as effortless and instantaneous as it sounds. You are pure consciousness, so you should be able to realize it immediately, instant. You should be able to realize it effortlessly. How much effort does it take? For you to see me, you just have to open your eyes. It takes less effort for you to realize that you are pure consciousness, and yet it's not working. Why it's not working 
is that all of this is said to be in the realm of Maya. Even our Vedanta which we are doing. And the power of Maya is wielded by Mahamaya, the Divine, the divine Mother. And there is a, we are now going into the realm of Tantra, into what is called Shakta Advaita. It is her wish according to them whom she frees and whom she keeps in this game. So if you want freedom, then what do you do? If it's entirely her wish, well the advantage is she's the mother, so she's a bit of a softy. If you really want want it and if you sincerely ask for it, she will give it to you. She will give it. To some extent it's already happening. The very fact that you are here is part of that process. It's part of the process, definitely. It's the benign smile of the Divine Mother, which is why we have an interest in spirituality. What is the relationship between devotion, Ishta Devata, and Advaita Vedanta? One of the most radical texts, more than this, extreme texts of Advaita Vedanta, there are two. One is Ashtavakra, another one is Ashtavakra, sometimes I speak about it. Another one is Avadhuta Gita, equally, as much as Ashtavakra. Very radical, non-realistic text. In the Avadhuta Gita, the first line answers this question. What is the connection between devotion to God in some form? And Advaita on this. Ishvara Nugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. It is by the special grace of God that people have an interest in Advaita Vedanta. Even the very interest in Advaita Vedanta is rare. Non-dualism, non-duality is rare. Very obviously why? Because we are engrossed in object. Nobody pays attention to subject. See, even the hard problem of consciousness we are talking about. Science having investigated so much into the super large galaxies and all, into the super small, how long it has taken for science to turn its attention towards the one who is investigating, towards the subject. So it's very difficult to turn to the subject. Though it's always present, you want that. It's a special grace of God. Well, the last question will be this gentleman, yes. Because we have run out of time. And remember, we have to see the whole universe has to be reduced into yourself. The big project, the second session. Hi, my name is uh, Pasit. Yes. And um, so one of the questions I've been struggling is um, separating the sense of I, uh, the ego, from the witness. Because I always get stuck at I. Yes. It seems to be unitary. Doesn't seem to have any attributes. Doesn't seem to change. Um, the only thing I can find distinction is when you're in super concentration, you don't have the feeling of I. Yes. And, and yet you are aware. Yeah. And every time you try and uh, look within, mm. everything just seems to be. I must be that I. Yes. Uh, so, that's so how do you distinguish yourself from the I? Yes, this is an important subject in Advaita Vedanta. Ahankara and consciousness are not the same thing. There's no time here, otherwise I can actually demonstrate that. Again, thanks to Greg Good, he has given this uh, exercise to see that you are not the I. But it's worthwhile to do that exercise. Let's do that. Let's do that. Less than five minutes. Very good. Okay. So remember what the question is, and a very important question. Whatever we do, right now also, this Advaita that we are doing, I am doing Advaita. That's the feeling. That's our intuitive feeling. But you just said, I am not the I also, I am not Ahankara. How do I do that? How do I separate myself from I? How do I, I separate myself from I? Notice, Shankaracharya in that famous hymn, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. If you remember the, the words, Mano buddhi ahankara chittani naham. We beautifully we sing it. Don't know what you are singing. If you translate, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, good so far. I am not the ego. I am not I. Ego means I. The sense of I. He says, ahankara naham. I am not I. But how? And very clearly I can uh, demonstrate it. 
Again, thanks to Drake. Good. Let's do this. So just sit up straight, relaxed. Now what he does is, he says, we are going to locate this I. We will find out this I. How? Think of yourself, I. Let's say I am sitting or I am standing. Now this I am standing, I'll ask you a question. This I, if we were forced to physically locate it, where is this I in the physical body? Somewhere in the body you feel, I'm here. Where? Now this is the question. You have to look at me for this. You have to look at me. Someone gone into meditation. <laughs> look at me. This, draw a line like this through your waist. Mentally. Draw a line through your waist. Your question is, the question is, the sense of I, is it above that line or below that line? Above. 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 Very obvious. You'll be a very weird person who says, I have a sense of ego in the knee. <laughs> So, Amma, yes, most people will say that. Alright, now I am located somewhere here. Now draw another line parallel to the ground through the um, chest region, just above your diaphragm, above your diaphragm, <coughs> here mentally. Now where is the I? Here or above this? Above. above. Almost everybody will say, somewhere above. Now a line to the neck. Where is the sense of I? Below or above? Above. Most will say above. Some might feel I am here. Some feel. Some. Doesn't matter. It's perfectly alright. But let's say it's above. It applies to the one in the chest also, if you feel like that. Above. It's somewhere here. In the head region. And it's very natural why it should be so. Nothing very mystical about it. Because most of our sense organs are, connect, are concentrated in the head. Uh, eyes and ears and uh, tongue and uh, lips and uh, mm -hmm. skin is very sensitive here, nose. Um, so it is natural that we have a very high presence in this area. So the eye sense will be here. Oh no, here in the head region somewhere. Now he says draw two lines, vertical, like this, like this, like this, through your head, mentally. Now we have divided the head into three parts. Here, here, here. Where is the sense of I? If I force you to say, no, select one. Center. Many will say center is somewhere behind my forehead or behind my eyes. Isn't it? Yes. Somewhere there. Now generally, gently focus there. The I sense, sense of ego, I, I. Behind the eyes, behind the temple, somewhere. There it is. Alright, you get the sense of an I-ness there. Now let me ask you, who is watching that I? To whom is it appearing? Don't answer. Clearly a sense of I is there, behind the head or behind the forehead or behind the eyes. But it is there for whom? What is experiencing the eye sense behind the eyes? Gently open your eyes. That is the answer to your question. There is a non-egoic awareness, which is the real you, to which even the sense of I is an appearance. The moment the I appears, it quickly commandeers to itself every all other resources of the body mind. My intellect, my memories, my personality, my body, my uh, life history, it all becomes about the ego. But behind the ego is awareness, which is not an object. That's why you can't catch it. Even the ego is an object. Object to whom? To that awareness. You can understand it intuitively. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Don't try to catch it. You can't catch it. Whatever you catch will be an object. Then what do you do? What is the thing? Be aware of being aware. That I am awareness. And with clarity dissociate yourself from anything objective. Body is objective, mind is objective, ego is objective. They are all there, not me. This is the state at which we are at the end of the first session. So energize yourself. 
Now next we are going to make the universe including body and mind disappear. <laughs> next session. After which we'll have a hearty lunch. All right, thank you very much. So maybe twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Twelve thirty to one to one thirty. Twelve thirty to one thirty. Okay, so friends, we're going to. Than the lamas can do it. It's 
It's a computer, mainframe. And so the days pass and it's coming closer when it will finish chanting the remaining names of God. And then the universe is supposed to come to an end. And the engineers are discussing among each other. Look, these weird guys, you know, it will st stop, the machine will stop very soon, having chanted the remaining names of God. And of course nothing will happen to the universe, then they'll get mad at us, they might beat us up or kill us or something. So let's, before the, it finishes, let's make good our escape. Let's run away from this place. They are mad people anyway. So it should, the story ends on this note, that these engineers, they are at the Tibetan Himalayan plateau at night. They are making their escape, surrounded by icy mountains on all sides and the oil lamps of the, the monastery. They have got a generator also to power the computer. You can hear it and the computer is still whirring away and they run away from that. Uh, they are walking towards the border somewhere and they can see from the monastery. And then they can hear the machine has stopped, finished, nine billion names of God. And they are hurrying up quickly before the lamas realize that they have run away. Uh, nothing has happened. And the um, mountain stars all over the, the sky is full of stars like dust, millions and millions of stars. And obviously they are looking back in nervousness at the mountain, what will happen now, at the monastery. And they look up in the sky, the stars are there and the story ends on, it goes on like this, the last line of the story is stunning. One of the engineers says, Look, and they look up at the sky and they see the stars are going out one by one. The universe is becoming dark, disappearing. And that's the end of the story. Actually, the universe is disappearing. <laughs> but not like that, by chanting the nine billion names of God. But now they're going to do that, make the universe disappear. How do you do that? Make the universe disappear. The approach taken here is, by proving the falsity of the universe. In Vedanta it is called Jagat Mithyatva. The world will still appear, but now you know that it's not a real world out there. It is an appearance in consciousness. How can you prove that? How can you remove the billions of entities of the universe? By showing their falsity. How would that help if it's even possible? Even then, how would it help? If something is false, then it's not an independent reality. The classic example of the snake and the rope. Let me make the example a little more complicated. Suppose there's a rope in the darkness somewhere and people don't know it and friends are walking by, three friends. And one says, look, look, there's a snake. And the other one says, no, it's a garland from the village temple which has been discarded. You get the image? It looks like that in the darkness. Mala. And the third friend says, no, no, it's a trickle of water. It look, looks like that. Now, in Sanskrit, Jaladhara. Sarpa, Mala, Jaladhara. Snake, garland, trickle of water. None of them are true. The truth is that there is only a rope there. When you realize that it's not a snake, it's a rope. That it's not a trickle of water, it's, it's a rope. It's not a discarded garland from the temple, it's a rope. Now what seem to be three things, turns out to be only one thing. And those three things don't exist. What existed was one thing only. So by proving the falsity of the snake, the garland and the trickle of water, you realize that there is only one reality and it's a rope. In the same way, if you prove that this world is an appearance, not separate entities out there, then even when the world is still appearing, you can say there is only one reality here. On a screen, when you watch a movie, there are thousands of people and places and so many events, things are there, objects and people and animals and things. And yet you know there is only one thing there, the screen. Actually there is nothing else. Then what are all these things which you are watching? They are false. They are appearances. The reality is the screen. Similarly, what Vedanta wants to show is, consciousness is the screen on which you watch the movie of the universe. 
Who watches? You, the, the screen itself is consciousness. You are that screen. You are the screen on which the movie of the universe, including your body and mind, appear. Which consciousness? What we discovered in the first session. That pure consciousness, that pure subject, in which all the objects, including mind, including body, including external universe, they all appear in you, that screen, that pure consciousness. They are not separate realities. They are appearances in Sanskrit, mithya. Why is it called false? Because the way we experience the world right now, this thing, we think it's a separate reality apart from me. That's what is false. After enlightenment, you will still experience this. Remember, three things. After enlightenment, will I continue to experience the world, my body and mind? Yes. What's the proof? Look at the lives of enlightened people. Did uh, Sri Ramakrishna, uh, enlightened, did he not realize oh, the difference between, say, Narendranath and uh, Latu and uh, Hazra? Did he not realize which is the Ganges and which is the Kali temple? He saw, he, all of that he saw. Exactly as it was before his enlightenment. One. Though he says that all this is my Divine Mother. My Divine Mother is indeed all this. And yet he sees, sees, like, sees it all. Second, the differences are also clear. After enlightenment, good and bad, uh, what, what one should eat and not eat, all these differences. Who is who, all those differences are clear. Not only that, the practical use of things, we have a hall. After enlightenment also, if you feel thirst, you can feel thirst, if you drink water, the thirst will be satisfied. Feel hunger, you can eat food and the hunger will be satisfied. It's not that things will lose their use I become enlightened, nothing works anymore. The whole universe is stopped. No. Everything will continue. You will continue to have the same experience of the universe. You, the, all the differences will still appear to you and everything will retain its practical usage in that level of reality. Just like a virtual reality. See, once you realize it's a movie, so you know it's not real. But that does not change the plot of the movie. The movie will remain the same. So how do you accomplish that? Shankaracharya says, falsity, how do you define falsity? Lack of an independent existence. If something appears to be different from another thing and yet cannot exist apart from it, you know it's truly not different. It's part of that. If two things can exist separately, you can say they are independent realities. So let me give you an example. Um, the classic example is, an old man comes and gives you this nice smile and you think, are they really his teeth or are they dentures? <laughs> now there is no way of knowing as long as both of them are together. But if you suddenly turn up at his house and knock on the door, surprise him, take him a surprise, and he opens the door and gives you this cute toothless smile. And you see the dentures sitting there in a the little bowl there. I had actually seen this in old monks, you know, so, so Swami, so. So you know, oh, I see. It's their separate. They don't, they can exist separately. They're not part of the same entity. Now, the definition of falsity is that which appears to be separate and independent, but actually is the same thing when we appear in that. Like the snake and the rope. The snake seen by mistake cannot exist apart from that rope. It is the rope alone which you are mistaking for the snake, is it not? If it were a real snake, it could slither off and exist separately. But that false snake cannot exist apart from that rope because it does not exist. It is the rope being mistaken for a snake. Similarly, what Vedanta wants to say is this entire universe which you are experiencing has no independent existence apart from awareness or consciousness. It seems to have. It seems to be it's out there and I am experiencing it with my consciousness. But what Vedanta says is, no, this universe is experienced in consciousness and never apart from it. Two things separately, like the dentures and that old person, you say they are separate entities. But for example, this table, this table, can you show me this table apart from the wood which constitutes the table? You can't. 
It seems to be, when I say table and wood, it seems to be two different things. But no. The table is not apart from the wood. But the wood can exist apart from the table. It was a log of wood earlier, it was wood in the carpenter's shop, it is now a table. If it breaks, it will still be wood. But the table won't be there anymore. So the table is an appearance in the entity called the wood. Exactly like that, this universe is an appearance in awareness. This is what Shankaracharya wants now is going to try to prove. Till now what we have got? What we have got is, you are consciousness apart from the universe, apart from body and mind. Now he's going to show mind, body, entire universe is nothing but <coughs> your consciousness. Now the approach will be different, the methodology will be different. How did we do it in the first session? Pointers. Five pointers were given. Now it will be mostly through examples. Try to intuitively grasp what he's trying to say. There's one reality in which multiplicity appears. So the example he uses is the example of the pot and clay. This is a classic old example from the Upanishads. Um, I'm going to read out the verse which he uses it at the very end of the book, 135. And then I'll explain what he has done. Karye <coughs> karanatayata so the nature translation of this is the nature of the cause in here is the effect and not vice versa. So through reasoning it is found that in the absence of the effect the cause as such also disappears. Perfectly clear. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> It's, it's actually very interesting. What he does is this. Take a pot, just imagine clearly. Take a pot, a clay pot, take a clay pot. Four stages, we go through four stages. And I'll make, I promise you this, pay attention and I'll make the pot disappear. <laughs> Imaginary pot, that's just right there. So, suppose there's a pot. I know one teacher who actually did it with a physical pot. <laughs> so there's a pot, it's like this one for example. Okay, let's take this. Don't worry, it will still be here. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> Mataji doesn't like it one bit. It dis disappears. <laughs> All right. Instead of clay, let us say brass. Brass pot. Or brass bowl. Brass bowl. Okay, let's take a brass bowl. Stage, four stages. And I promise I'll make it disappear by the fourth one. <laughs> here is a, uh, is a bowl. It's a bowl. Stage one. Now, in stage two, we are told this bowl has a cause. Cause means material cause. In Sanskrit, upadana karana. It simply means it is made of something which is brass. So, brass is the cause, karana. And the bowl is the effect, karyam. By cause, I mean material cause. The material out of which something is made. The material cause of the table is Wood. Material cause of a wave in the ocean is? Water. water. Material cause of this bowl is? Grass. Okay. So there is a cause of this. The bowl is an effect and the cause is brass. Second. Go deeper. Where is the cause? Where is the bowl? Here. Clearly. Where is the cause? You just mentioned brass is the cause. Where is the cause? Here only. Investigate. In stage 3, investigate. When you investigate, you see, what is this here all around? Brass. Inside? Brass. Isn't it? Bottom of it? Brass. What you touch? Brass. What you hear? Brass. Inside, outside, top, bottom, through and through, it's brass and brass only. Right? In fact, the bowl is nothing apart from the brass constituting it. If it were, could you show me the bowl apart from the brass? You can't. You can show me the bowl like this. But you can't show me the bowl apart from the brass. In fact, the bowl has no existence apart from the brass. The weight of the bowl is the weight of the brass. What you touch is the brass. Yeah. 
And what you touch here is? We don't we say touch wood? Do we ever say touch table? <laughs> we know we are touching wood here. You are touching brass. The weight is brass. The feel of it is brass. The properties of this bowl, chemical and all that is brass. The properties of brass. In fact, there is no bowl here apart from the brass. Fourth, we go to the final stage. Bowl is only a name and a form. The reality is brass. Brass satyam, bowl mithyam. Brass is the reality of which bowl is an appearance. Look at this. Can you see the bowl? If I say, can you see the brass? Yes. yes. In fact, I'll tell you the only thing that you're seeing is brass. So no, Swami, you're holding a bowl. I'm holding brass. What you call a bowl is a form, like this. It's a name, you give a name, it's called bowl. It's a use, you can do this and you can, um, you, can, you can hit it and you can get a sound from it. It's a bowl. Bowl is name, form and function, not reality. Reality is grass. There is no real thing called a bowl here. Bowl is an appearance. Grass is the reality. Now look at the verse. Kārye kāraṇata yāta First, invoke the cause in the effect. What is the effect? Bowl. Invoke the cause. Cause is grass. Then next, kārane nahi kāryata. In the brass there is no effect. There is no bowl. Is there a bowl in the brass? When you look at it as brass, is there anything called a bowl? It was brass earlier in the, in the, in the foundry. If it is melted down, it will still be brass. Where has the bowl gone? There is no thing called a bowl in the brass. In the cause, there is no effect. Then, karnatvam tato gachet. If there is no effect, why call it a cause? If there is no effect, why call it a cause? What is it a cause of? There is no effect. The brass did not produce a thing called a bowl. Are you following me? The brass did not produce a thing called a bowl. So the brass did not produce an effect. It's not a cause of a thing called a bowl. It is the only reality that there is. The weight is brass, the feel is brass, the properties are brass, the space it occupied by brass only. If it is an extra thing called bowl here, show me the space it occupies. Show me the extra weight of that thing. No? Show me the bowl apart from the brass. No? I said in, in uh, on Broadway, it's a very expensive jewelry shop you see called Tiffany's. And I said the reality of the ornaments is the gold. The value is the gold. The substance is the gold. I'm giving the gold and the wealth example. So somebody said, no, Swami, you don't understand. The, the value is the brand Tiffany. <laughs> you might think so. Answer is no. If I go to the shop and I say, Good. Keep the brand. I'll even allow you to keep the sticker. Let me take the gold away. How much value will they make? Nothing. The brand Tiffany cannot float in the air. It depends on the underlying reality of the gold. To that you can add many things. But the reality is only gold. The reality is only brass here. And Shankaracharya's example, the reality is the clay of the pot. We are bewildered by language and by form into thinking that there is a new thing here. There is no new thing here. Saints of this. Similarly, he says, now look at the universe. Remember, it's not about clay pots or brass bowls. It's about the universe and consciousness. Now look at the universe. You are told that this entire universe, step one, like the bowl, step two, it has a cause. The cause is Brahman, existence, consciousness, such it. Third, like you examine this bowl to find out the brass, examine this word, find out isness, awareness. Just take it as awareness. In every experience of life in the universe, of your life for example, everywhere it is permeated by your awareness. Tell me one thing in your life with which is not permeated, pervaded by your awareness, by you the awareness. It can't be there. 
whether you are walking, talking, thinking, uh, loving, hating, desiring, eating, sleeping, dreaming, all of that is done in awareness, just like the bowl exists in the brass. Your entire life is in awareness. Your entire experience of the universe has to be in awareness, otherwise there can be no experience. So your, is your entire entirety of your experience of the universe is pervaded through and through by awareness. The universe, just like the bowl, is a name and form superimposed upon awareness. Another example is your dream. In dreams, there are people, there are places, there are events, there is even a kind of time flowing, there is space, and you are also there with a the body. With a specific body there in the dream. And yet, none of it is different from you, the dreamer, the dreamer's mind. Time, space, people, events, things. Just like that, none of it is different from that one consciousness here. Remember, here I'm not talking about the mind. Yesterday I mentioned, differentiate between Swarupa Jnana and Vritti Jnana. Consciousness in itself and the mind which knows things. Because the mind only knows something. There are many things in this universe which your mind does not know. You might say, what about those things? Are they existing? They are existing in one awareness. Part of that is made an object of knowledge through your mind, his mind, her mind. Part of it may not be made an object of knowledge, but it all exists in that one. Uh, in a good way to understand this is, it is not only awareness, but it is also sat, being, isness. So logically speaking, anything that exists shares in being, in isness. If it did not, if it was not in isness, what would happen to it? It would be is not, it would disappear. Just like the bowl, brass bowl, if I say part of it is not in the brass, that part doesn't exist. It has to be in the brass, if it's a brass bowl. If it's an existent universe, it has to be in that being or isness. In fact, theologians of every religion, they put it in that language. You know, the language used by the teachers of religion, those who believe in God, God is the creator, by which they say God is the cause of this universe. Every religion says that, whichever believes in, in God. But they don't take the further, further steps to reduce everything back to God, one reality only. All are appearances in God. Then you will have Advaita, non-duality. What they do is, they stop at the second stage. What is the first stage? Take the bowl. Second stage, the bowl has a cause, brass. What do they do? They take the universe. In the second stage, the universe has a cause, God. And then they stop there. If you stop there, the problem will be, it will appear like there are two different things, God and this universe. And that's how dualistic religions stop there. But then they have a huge problem. What's the problem? The problem of proof. How do you know that there is such a thing as God? Then they have to depend on faith. My book says so, my teacher says so, that's it, finished. Then science will come and show you, there is nothing different from this universe. This universe, I can explain everything through the Big Bang and through Darwinian evolution. Which is true. There is nothing other than this ball here. But the reality of this ball is brass. This very ball. Brass is not, suppose I tell you it's a, it has a cause called brass and I stop there. You will think, okay, bow, and that brass, where is that? By investigating this only, you will come to that reality. By investigating this universe only, you come to this, the being awareness, isness awareness. If you stop at the second stage, there is something called God who is the cause of the universe. And you stop there, it becomes a dualistic religion. They are not false, they are true. What they are trying to point towards is true. But in today's age, it immediately comes under attack from powerful atheistic forces. Alan Watts, the clay pot theory, that ultimately the clay is the reality and pot is the appearance. He says if you stop in the second stage, there is a pot and its cause is clay. There is a universe, its cause is God. And you stop there, Alan Watts calls it the crackpot theory. <laughs> because it's immediately open to objections, 
people will uh, disbelieve, atheism, all those problems will come immediately. What the advantage that Advaita has is, it reduces the universe back to awareness isness, which you are directly, you feel it all the time. All the time it's directly available to you. In fact, if you combine, yesterday I mentioned the hard problem of consciousness and the hard problem of matter. If you combine the two, you get Advaita. Hard problem of consciousness points to the witness consciousness which you are, which we discovered in the first session. And the hard problem of matter reduces the material universe into that consciousness. That would be the answer. So, one non-dual awareness. So, the crucial thing is proving the falsity of the universe. Now, what Shankaracharya does is, the approach he takes, as I said, is through examples. He tries to continuously prove it through examples. In fact, from verses 59 onwards up to 88, I counted 15 different examples he has given. Series of examples. To prove one point only, how is the world false? Like this. It's not a, an argument, not like not a pointer like we gave earlier. It's more like a like an example. It's like this. So what are those examples? Let's take a few and then we will go into discussion. This is from verse 59. What's the point here? Anatma mithyatva. The falsity of the not-self. The self is pure consciousness. That's the only reality. And what is the not-self? Mind, body, external universe. They are appearances. We'll see. 59th verse. Yadvan ridi ghata bhrantim Shukta varajata sthitim Tadvad brahmani jivatvam Vikshamano na pasyati he says, just as in the clay, or we can use this example, in the brass there is an appearance of a bowl, just as in the, it's called nacre, on the seashores, you have the shell which shines from a distance like silver. This is a classic example in Advaita Vedanta. Shukti Rajata. The seashell, it shines like silver. It's not silver. So it's, a, it's like a rope snake example. It's another classic example they used in Advaita literature. Just as a bowl appears, is imagined in brass when it takes a particular form. Similarly, just like seashell, the nacre shines like silver, it's mistaken for silver. Just like that, the word is mistaken for, the, the, uh, uh, or Brahman is mistaken for the word. Brass is mistaken for a bowl, seashell is mistaken for silver, Brahman is mistaken for a word. When Brahman appears like this, with names and forms and events and people and things, we say it's a universe out there. This is what he is saying. Yadvat mridi ghata pranti. In clay, there is an appearance of, or an error that it is a bowl. Now remember, it looks like a bowl. You can use it like a bowl, and you can call it a bowl. But never forget, it is clay and clay alone. Similarly, here it looks like a world. There are people, and you can love, hate, you can carry on business, you can learn things, you can do everything in the world, everything goes on as it is. But never forget, the underlying reality is consciousness. And you are that underlying reality. Another example he gives here is seashell and silver. So there's a funny story. Uh, many, many uh, centuries ago in ancient India, they used to have debates, you know, you are a dualistic school, non-dualistic school. So in one, one kingdom on the seashore, um, the king was a non-dualist and the pundit in his, in his court was a non-dualist, Advaitin. And a dualistic teacher came to challenge the non-dualist and um, said that, no, the word is not false. It's not that the word is appearing in Brahman. There is, there is God, but there is also a word, a real word apart from God. 
So it's not an appearance. And um, so you can have the world apart from God. And the scholar, the non-dualistic scholar in the court of the king, probably had not done his homework for a long time. He lost the debate. He lost the debate. And finally the, the visiting scholar who won the debate, he has to be rewarded, he has to be given a lot of money. And so the king, who had read a lot of Vedanta, he said to that visiting scholar, you're right, the world is not an appearance in, in Brahman, it's a separate reality. Just as the silver appearing in the seashells on the shore, they are separate realities. I allow you to take all the silver away from my kingdom from the seashells there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example. What other examples? Many examples he gives. Can you see the difference in the approach here? This is by by metaphor and simile and example rather than by argument here. Again a clay pot example. Yatam ridi ghato nama kanake kundala bhidha shukta hira jata khyati jiva shakta stathapare very beautiful verse. It says, just as clay is called pot, brass is called bowl, is called a bowl, name. Just as gold is called an earring, gold is called an earring, in a particular form it's called an earring. Just as a seashell is called silver by mistake, exactly like that, Brahman is called Jiva. No, just make it. Literally what you call yourself, an individual sentient being, you are calling Brahman an individual sentient being. You are calling the ultimate reality of this universe an individual little being. I am this person. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita commentary, Shankaracharya says, Yes, all this. suppose an opponent says to me, oh this is fine, but I am an ordinary individual being, I have to do a lot of sadhana now on, and ultimately maybe at this life, maybe in some life later I will realize my oneness with Brahman. And then Shankaracharya says, for such fools, he said, there is no hope. What he is saying is literally now you are Brahman. Literally. You are just calling yourself a human being. An individual sentient being, Jiva, someone in bondage. We are calling Brahman that. It's just like on a screen, the only light. But some of that you call, this is Harry Potter. This is the magic school. This is the uh, headmaster, Dumbledore, something. What is it really? It's all light. It's just a screen and light playing on it. But you call this portion this character and you associate a story with it, so on. So he says, Jiva Shabdas Tatha Pare. Pare means a transcendent reality, being, awareness. That is called sentient being. That is called the Jiva, individual being. Man, woman, I'm unhappy, miserable, small. Whom are you calling unhappy, miserable, small? Brahman, the infinite reality. You are that already. Then what is enlightenment? Enlightenment just enables you to realize, oh, this is what it was. Think. When you are enlightened, now that blessed day when it comes, when you realize, I am Brahman, will you realize, oh, I was this little being called Sarva Priyananda and uh, searching for Brahman, now I realize, I am Brahman. Will that be enlightenment? No. You know what it will be like? You will realize, oh, I always was Brahman. All throughout, whenever I, even when I thought I was this little person, subject to birth and old age and decay and death, subject to so many traumas of life, ups and downs, miserable. All that time I was completely unharmed, perfectly safe, the one infinite existence, infinite awareness, infinite bliss. It is Brahman alone, it is God alone who is being called man, individual being, or human being. I remember the story of one monk. I never met him. I read his writings. He wrote only in Hindi and Sanskrit, so he's not well known outside India. Some of you may have heard of Gita Press. So they sell Gita Press. Gita Press. They, they sell all the scriptures 
uh, mostly in Sanskrit and Hindi, but in other Indian languages also, and we find them in railway stations in India. So many of those translations were done by this person, who I'm talking about. He was a married man at that time, he was a scholar, a pundit, and he used to work for Gita Press, translating it. Later on, he became a monk. So he has narrated in one place how he became a monk. He was well known as Akhandananda Saraswati later on in his life. He used to live in Vrindavan. He was one of the greatest scholarly monks of India in the pre and post independence time. Anyhow, I read his story how he became a monk. He said, he said that he was a Bhagavata scholar. That means he used to teach the Bhagavata. And in the North India, also in Kerala, we have Bhagavata Saptaha, that means whole period, 10 days, 15 days goes in expounding the story of Krishna and all that Bhagavata. So he used to do that. Um, he would go every year to, to Haridwar, Kankha, and there he would hold up, he would teach. Now he said, there was a monk who lived at that time, was well known as an enlightened person. He was called Bhikshu Shankarananda. Not, not well known, nobody knows much about him nowadays. Our Swami Dhirishanandaji met him, Bhikshu Shankarananda, and wrote his uh, biography. It's published, a small book. So this Bhikshu Shankarananda was a strange man. He was supposed to be enlightened and he was, people understood that he is Jivan Mukta. He used to live on a little cot under a tree. And uh, there are many interesting stories about him. For example, somebody asked him, you are a non-dualist in Advaitin. Um, where are your books? You are supposed to read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, we don't see any books. We said, oh, I have books. I have three books. And they teach me all that is to be known. What are the three books? Where are they? Oh, I have only three books. Waking, Dreaming and Sleeping. <laughs> and they reveal to me the truth of what I am. You know, the Mandukya Upanishad that I am the witness of all these three states. So he was like that. So, he told this Pandit, who later became Akhandananda Saraswati, he told this Pandit, and he writes, Vikshu Shankarananda is to visit him. After giving my lectures on Bhagavat, I would visit him. He said, he was a strict non-dualist, Vikshu Shankarananda, not interested in Bhakti and all of that. He, um, so this Pandit said, would you mind if I tell you a little about the Bhakti of the Bhagavat? You will enjoy it. You have not heard this earlier. So this great non-dualist enlightened Jeevan Mukta sitting on that cot, he said, all right, come every day and tell me a little bit. The tenth skanda of the Bhagavata, tell me a little bit about that. So he would come. Every day he would narrate for an hour. And once the talks were finished at the end of the week, he said, mm, that's it. And uh, tomorrow I'll go back home. So please give me your blessings. And he looked up and he saw this Great non-dualist, yeah, Brahma Gyani, is sitting on the cot and weeping, with tears down his cheek, think, thinking about Krishna, so overcome with devotion. He said, come tomorrow in the morning, early in the morning, come to me, I will give you, this is Dakshina, if you, to, if you listen to these things, you have to give something to the person who is expounding the scriptures. So I will give you my Dakshina, the payment for what you have given me. So this Pandit said, all right, I'll come tomorrow. And he goes the next day in the morning to Vikshu Shankarananda who's sitting on the cot. And Vikshu says, come with me to the Ganga. The river is flowing there in Kankar. And he takes it to a secluded spot and pulls him close. He held his hair and pulled him close and whispered into his ears a particular mantra is there, known only to the monks. It is not printed, it's not shared. Only those who become monks, they know it. And in, in the Himalayas there, common people, are, they know that that mantra you should not hear. Because the, the, the tradition is, if you hear it, you have to become a monk. If you hear it, you have to become a monk. Don't worry, I won't tell you the mantra. <laughs> <laughs> you have to lose it, you have to walk out immediately from your life and become a monk. It's just a custom. It's not that you have to, but it's a custom. Uh, there. So it's a very powerful thing. It's never printed anywhere. And so this Bhikshu Shankarananda whispered that into the ears of this person. And he said, go, in Hindi, ja, go, from now never think of yourself as a jiva, as an embodied being. But you are Brahman, think of yourself as Brahman. And uh, he writes in his reminiscence, this Swami Akhanda, he says, it, it took me years, I think years after that I became a monk. I did inevitably become a Swami, Swami Akhanda Saraswati. 
But from that day onwards, I can tell you honestly, I never thought of myself as an individual human being, a limited being. There's no proper English translation for Jiva. Jiva is just us, a limited being. I always thought of myself as the infinite. So it's a name given to the infinite is Jiva. Um, more examples. Yathaiva Bhyomni Nilatvam Yathani Rammarusthale Purushatvam Yathasthano Tadvad Vishwam Chidatmani And the beautiful verse it says Just as you see blue in the sky, you can see it now. When you look outside, you will see blue in the sky. There is no blue there. There is no blue. Did you think southwest plains are blue because they fly through the sky? No. It's, there's no blue color there. It's an optical illusion created in the laws of physics we know. So the sky is not blue, yet blue appears in the sky. Exactly like that, the universe appears in consciousness, which you are. Then, yata niram manusthale, as water appears in a mirage in the desert. There's no water there. From a distance it looks like water. It looks like water. If you go there, no, no water. Like that, this universe appears in you, the consciousness. Purushattvam yatha sthano. Third example here. In one verse is given three examples. Just as this is an example which will require little explanation. In a distance there is a tree stump. And from a distance a person thinks, there is a, a man waiting for me there. Imagine a dry tree stump with two little branches without any leaves. So it looks like a man standing there with the hands extended. So the idea of a man is superimposed on the tree stump. Like that, the universe is superimposed on consciousness itself. So he says, Dabdvad Vishwam Chidatmani. In consciousness, which is your very self, the universe appears there. Just like a dream, it appears there. It is not different from you, the consciousness, not a second reality. Not second, na dvaitam, advaitam. Once you realize this, I'll end with this. Once you realize this, then what happens? The same brass bowl or clay pot example. Shankaracharya says, Atha shuddham bhaved vastu. This is 136. Towards the very end of the book. Atha Shuddham Bhaved Vastu Yadvai Vajama Gocharam Drashtabhyam Vidkhate Naiva Drishtante Puna Punaha. In this way, then you realize which way? Four stages. Stage one, bowl. Stage two, brass bowl. Stage 3, where is the brass? Investigate, it's everywhere. In fact, there is nothing but brass here. The bowl is an appearance. Stage 4, brass only. Not about brass bowls. Take the universe. Investigate in every experience, consciousness. And in fact, there is no universe which you have anywhere, everywhere, apart from awareness of consciousness. Then consciousness only is the reality in which the universe appears. Consciousness real, universe is an appearance. He says, that consciousness, it cannot be expressed by language, it cannot be conceived of by thought. In fact, thought and language, they function because of that consciousness which you are. That consciousness alone activating the mind, thoughts and language. But language and thoughts cannot catch all of that. You are that consciousness. Use this example of clay pot or brass bowl, puna puna, again and again, and try to maintain this insight. Not about brass or clay, but about consciousness. But sometime, would you like to ask questions? Yes. Um, so Tell you, us your name. I'm Raj. Yes. Uh, so I'm, uh, <clears throat> the question is that the, the late 
gets to the Purushottam Yoga in Bhagavad Gita. And uh, he seems to say in that there is a Kshara and the Akshara. And then he comes saying that there is a Purushottam. So is he trying to say then <coughs> that there is, in the brass and the bowl example, let's say there is a Kshara which is the bowl and Akshara which is the brass. Is there something other than these two? What, what is, where is the Purushottama coming from? Hmm. Purushottama will be the brass. And that power of Purushottama by which the brass appears as a bowl to you is the Akshara. If you look at Shankara's interpretation of that verse which you are talking about, Purushottama is seen as Nirguna Brahman, pure consciousness. Akshara is Maya Shakti through which that same Nirguna Brahman appears as Kshara, the changing universe, our bodies and minds, external world. Yes. Take it as three. Consciousness, Maya, universe. Or even more precise if you want it, Nirguna Brahman, Saguna Brahman, and the uh, Jarat. Purushottama, Akshara, Kshara. But remember, this is uh, Advaita, Advaitic interpretation. Ramanuja will give a different interpretation. Would you, would you explain a Ramanuja's interpretation? I won't. That will confuse the issue. <laughs> yes. Question. Somebody else raise their hand. Please come. So maybe it's more about the method. Uh, no. Now the knowledge is there. Uh, now going from the suffering to the realization. Uh, after, uh, like yesterday you gave us that three cross three matrix that you were trying to look at, which is more towards sadhana, satsang and seva, like selfless work mm -hmm. and today you gave us one of the things is, did you get it? If you get it, hold on to it. Mm -hmm. What do we need to continue practicing? Is it just meditation and seva that takes us to this realization? So what do we no need to continue? That is the subject for tomorrow. Very good question. It's a nice segue to tomorrow's session, which is actually insight meditation. These two sessions were meant to generate the insight. If they haven't, repeat. Stay with it. The insight will come. A clarity will come. But then your question will be, I get it, but how to make it a living reality? How to stabilize it so that it's there all the time? Many people say, I have got it. The moment I step out of it, I lose it. So how to make it stable? For that, the Vedantic meditation which, have, uh, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow, insight meditation, that's tomorrow. The methods of making it stable. You might say, if that is the whole point, then why don't we go straight to it? Why all this talking? It won't work. It won't work. There's, there's, that's, I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. That is the difference between yogic meditation and Vedantic meditation. Vedantic meditation is insight meditation. You must have the insight to meditate. That insight, you have to meditate on that insight. If you don't have that insight, then you have to get that insight. To get that insight, you have to listen and reflect. Shavana Manana. Whereas yogic meditation is, you go to a yoga teacher. Put on your yoga pants or something and you sit down on the, on the mat and the teacher will tell you, sit like this, so breathe like this, think like this, concentrate like this. You can do it. Instruction, instruction, practice it. You can do it. But here you cannot practice. What we, what I'll talk about tomorrow will be empty unless you have the insight that we are talking about today. If you straight away try to do those things, at the best what will happen is your mind will become a little calm. But enlightenment will not come. It's like going to the uh, class and the, how do I learn physics? The professor says, look, come to the class and listen to me, stage one. Stage two, read the notes and think about it. Stage three, sit quietly, still and very intensely, stay with it. You will get it. So if I now think that, oh, that third one, sitting quietly, I will get it. Then let me not go to class and read the book, I will just sit quietly. Will I get a PhD in physics? No, <laughs> nothing. So without the functions like that, just the sitting quietly in meditation is not enough. What is required is the build up to it. Once you've got it, you'll feel like sitting with it quietly and making it a living reality. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow. And the other sadhana are all uh,
preparations for that, helpful for that sitting quietly. Yes, please come. I'll come to you next. I'm Jyoti Nasukla. I think the comment I have is that we keep talking about Jagat Mithya hmm. and then we are saying no, the reality is same. It must separate from true reality, consciousness, everything is consciousness. Hmm. But I think that message in one sense is a negative message hmm. because a ball is a ball. Hmm. Jug is a jug. Mm. All the different shapes that we see mm. are real. There is nothing wrong with that. What is to be seen is what Krishna says in uh, chapter 6 Your mom, Pashati, is a mm. In other words, see everything as it is. Mm. There is nothing false about it. Mm. But there is God behind everything. So yes. we need to see God through everything. Right. That to me is a positive message. True, true. Uh, that's why saying that the world is false might sound negative, but there is a there is a deep truth in this. It's not for nothing that Jagat Mithyatva has been so strongly stressed. Uh, there is a there is a deep truth in this. Notice what you said. Bowl is a bowl. No, it is not. The moment you say bowl is, let me ask you, what is here? Grass. The bowl has no isness. Never. Some, somebody, when I gave this example, somebody said, No, alright, I understand what you are saying about brass, but both are reality. Both is also reality, brass is also reality. Not at all. Not at all. If there are two realities, show me separately. Bowl is, we say this because of, um, you know, we are not thinking philosophically. Bowl is a name, clearly bowl. It's different from the name brass. It's a new name, bow. It's a shape. You might say, but the shape is there. No. Is the shape there or is brass there? Brass is there. <coughs> Dependent on that, there is a shape. And bow is a use. Wherever you can put things in it, which you cannot put in brass. Just brass, a block of brass. So, but that use also depends on the brass itself. Ultimately, this reality is to be appreciated. In order to appreciate that, the falsity of the bowl must also be appreciated. Otherwise, you will never get to it. What happens is, our senses are continuously attracted and pulled by the world. And therefore, we miss the reality. Yes, the purpose is always to see God in everything. Right. But you know what we get deceived into? We are so invested in everything that we miss the God there. There's a very interesting poem written by Mary Hale to Swami Vivekananda, which published. She writes, I understand what you have taught. She writes to Swami Vivekananda that everything is God. You know what Swami Vivekananda wrote back? I have never said such strange things. He said, I have never taught such clear doctrine that everything is God. Never. She's shocked. You have said it again and again. You have said everything is God. Upanishad also says everything is God. He said, no, what is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is, everything is not God only is. It's not that there is everything and everything is somehow God. No. God only is, appears as universe. The moment you see universe is also there, God is also there, and somehow you have to see God in the universe, duality in you. That's why Jagat Mithyato. Now, if you ask Advaita teachers, what is the purpose of this Jagat Mithyato? Apart from philosophy, spiritual life, what is the purpose? Say two things. It's saying Mahanam Saswati referred to, he says this. He says, first thing is Vairagya. If the world is an appearance, then you are neither tempted nor scared by it. Desire, hatred, fear, all of that goes away from for the world. If it's an appearance. I remember when we were kids, once we went to see this 3D cinema. We have to put on glasses, and then everything will look like 3D in the screen. So we were very little kids, but I still remember. So in the screen, some kind of 
Ramayana or Mahabharata or something was going on. When they would shoot arrows, the arrow would fly out of the screen towards where you would duck. <laughs> all the kids were there, but nobody was scared. They were laughing and delighted and ducking and all of that. They are playing the game along, but they were delighted by it. If it was a real arrow shooting, everybody would have been terrified. And there was one screen I remember, one shot in which somebody's uh, thali, a plate full of laddus, delicious sweets, is being extended. It comes out of the screen and hovers in front of your nose. And all the kids are doing like this, you know, and then they are laughing. But nobody is disappointed that we can't get the laddus because they know that it's not really there, it looks like that. So the appreciation of the mithya for the falsity of it. It removes the temptation and the fear. You are not afraid of the arrows. You are not tempted by the laddus. Both you enjoy. That generates vairagya. That is the first use of mithyatva. Falsity generates vairagya. Vairagya means dispassion for the world. It distances you. It gives you that psychological space from the world. The world doesn't trap you by fear or by temptation. One. But this is how we normally understand Vithyata, why it is taught. But then that Akhandan Saraswati points out, uh, he says, this is what you normally are taught in Vedanta? And we think, yes. That's why Vithyata falsity is important. And he says, Ye to kache Vedanti kahte hai. This is the teaching of half-baked Vedantins. This is not the real purpose of falsity. The real purpose of falsity of the world is something startling. Why? If I say that the snake is false, it's a rope. Classic example, you know all know the example? If you come to the Vedanta Society, you learn the example. There are always snakes and ropes. So, <laughs> snake and rope. I say snake is false, rope is real, you are seeing a snake. If snake is false, rope is real, and you are seeing a snake, let me ask you, where is the real rope? Where is the real rope? In the snake. In the snake, right there, you might say. You might say, right there. That is the great spiritual purpose of the falsity of the world. When you say, world is false, Brahman is real, then what you are experiencing as the world is God. If you say, world is there, it's real. And it is somehow pervaded by God. And you have to sort of look, where is God in the world here somewhere? You have to search for God. It will become Dvaita or Vishishta Dvaita. Advaita makes the world disappear and transforms it into God. Transforms it in a way of saying, shows you that it is God and nothing else. That is the deep meaning of the falsity of the world. Two, two uses, for practical purposes, not for philosophy, for practical purposes, spiritual purposes. One is, it creates, it sets you free from the world, it's special. It's not real. As one Swami in the Himalayas told me, Dikta hai Mahatma ji hai nahi. Uh, it appears to you, O oh Swami, it's not real out there. The second thing, I have told you the story about the, sometimes, the river. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not all of you have heard it. No. Let me tell you. This, uh, Swami has to go to in the Himalayas to learn Vedanta. He was teaching Ashtavatra. So one day he told us that how he had seen TV. A TV crew had come to Gangotri to film the, ri the river, the descent of the Ganga into, from the glacier. And this Swami lives, I don't know if he's still alive, he used to live on the bank of that Gauri Kund, I think, Gangotri. So they thought the Swami has never seen TV, so we should show him how TV functions, this marvel of modern technology. So they put a TV and a cracked up a generator, and put pointed the camera at the uh, river. And then they showed the Swami. And Swami told us uh, in India translate, he said, Sabdika Mahatma ji, Pani Bhati, Ganga ji Bhati hai, Kalkal karti hai, sunta, Sunai Pata hai. I saw everything was Swami's. I could see the Ganges, uh, the Ganga flowing, I could hear the gurgling sound of the water. And then I asked, Sir, give me a glass of Ganga water from there. <laughs> And then the director, the crew member laughed and said, Oh Swami, what are you saying? Uh, he said, oh, Swami, it dikta hai. I said, Wah hai nahi kuch. It just appears like that. It's not really there. And then the Swami turned to your I can never forget. We are all sitting around him, this towering mountain caves and peaks all around. 
a place he is flowing down in the river, flowing about a hundred feet below. He turned towards us. He said, "Tu Mahatma Ji, ye sab dikta hai, hai nahi kuch." <laughs> All of this is appearing in your awareness. It's not a reality apart from what you are seeing. Only that you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it, and seems to be real. And yet, nothing apart from the experience in awareness itself. That is the great purpose of the second, the second use of jagat mithya, or the falsity of the world, the deep spiritual import of that. Swami Vivekananda said, "Never approach anything except as God. The people in your life, the places you visit, the things which happen to you." All of that, don't it doesn't seem to be God at all. It is. Advaita helps us to understand how it can be possible. Last question. Yes, please ask there. Yeah. My question is that we have been taught about uh, meditating on objects like pictures of Swami, Yogananda, yeah. Ramakrishna. So we meditate, think about them, and then close our eyes and you know dissolve into it. Now, do I mean that? I think that's kind of non-dualism or dualism and and uh, vedanta's uh, meditation practice conflicts with it very good questions perfect question to go into tomorrow's session <laughs> how is vedantic meditation insight meditation different from the meditation we are accustomed to we are accustomed to a variety of meditation some meditate on om some meditate on a picture as you said some meditate on an image some meditate on a mantra the buddhists they have meditation on the breath following the breath, attending to it. A variety. There are visualization meditations, there are deity meditations, Ishta Devata, there are mantra meditations, a variety of meditation techniques. Then some meditate on quietening the mind down, Chitta Vritti Nirodha, Patanjali Yoga. So all of this I am calling yogic meditation. And what I am going to talk about tomorrow is completely different from it. It's just the reverse of that. So we will see tomorrow. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namas